2014 school year, <coughs> more kids had to get to proficient. And those benchmarks were mandated. So maybe it had to be 25%, and then the next year, 30%, and then the next year, 35%. And those benchmarks were called adequate yearly progress. So when you do this debate and you hear the letters AYP, <coughs> that's adequate yearly progress, that's the federal government telling the states every year you had to get this much closer to 100% of the children being proficient in the standards. How did the measurement happen? The states were forced to develop <coughs> academic assessments in the mandated subjects. They were used to measure the children. And No Child Left Behind said, that by 12 years after the law was passed, by the close of the 2013-2014 school year, 100% of the children had to be proficient. Every child in the state had to be proficient. Well, that's a ridiculous statement, isn't it? That you can, by government fiat, force every child to learn to the proficient standard. But the states could define the word proficient however they wanted. So let me show you what happened. Stand up. Wiggle while you're up there. Exercise good for you. Okay. This is vocal performance. When you can meet the standard, you can sit down. But you cannot sit down until you meet the standard. Are you ready? Luciano Pavarotti. Anybody who can sing like Pavarotti can sit down. <laughs> Soloist with the New York Met. Chorus member with the New York Met. Soloist with the Regional Symphony. Chorus member with the Regional Symphony. Soloist with the Church Choir sings in the church choir. You are a very unmusical group. <laughs> sings in the shower and enjoys it. Can't carry a tune in a bucket. Can't find the bucket. I am the state. I am required to prove that 100% of the children are proficient in vocal performance. But I can define proficient wherever I want. Where am I going to set the standard? Where did you all sit down? at the shower. <laughs> I am a teacher in a classroom. There is no reward whatsoever for any teacher in this system moving one child one inch beyond the standard. They only have to reach the standard. Where is that teacher going to spend all of her time? With Mr. and Mrs. Can't Carry a Tune in a Bucket out there, getting them up to, sings in the shower and enjoys it. What about Mrs. Can't Find the Bucket? Well, the teacher's going to ignore her because I know I can't get to 100%, so I'm going to cut my losses. What about the child for whom the standard should have been Pavarotti? See, that child walked into the classroom already able to sing in the shower and enjoy it, so they would pass the test. That child gets ignored. Did education succeed for that child or fail? It failed. But it's a silent failure because that child will pass the test. This system changes the goal of education from enlightening a child to reaching a standard. And the standard becomes the goal, not the education of the child. And when that happens, the standards for everybody go down. Now, is that new information? No, it's not. You probably heard I was an advisor to the Reagan administration, and when President Reagan was in office, he and Tip O'Neill, they had kind of an interesting relationship. Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House. They were both old Irish gentlemen. They enjoyed a beer once in a while. They decided to study the status of education in America, and so they appointed a commission, and the commission spent 18 months and eventually came out with a document called A Nation at Risk. And A Nation at Risk actually talked about this minimum competency movement and said that the, when you set these minimum standards, the minimum becomes the maximum, and education for everyone goes down. And in fact, that's exactly what the research has shown. So what happened here in West Virginia? <coughs> well, in West Virginia, you created a state assessment, and these are your assessment results, and I pulled this right off of your state's website. So I know this is smaller, grade four, the re number of children in your fourth grade in the 2013-2013 school year who were graded proficient was 47.2%. In Washington, the federal government has what's called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It is a congressionally mandated achievement test. It's given every other year. So in 2013, the West Virginia fourth graders took the National Assessment in reading. 
Now, either you can read at the fourth grade level or you cannot read <coughs> at the fourth grade level. When they took the state assessment, 47.2 tested it proficient. But when those same children in the same year took the national assessment on fourth grade reading, only 28% of them were proficient. Well, that's a big difference, isn't it? It means that the state <coughs> lowered the bar for what it meant to be proficient. In eighth grade, your state assessment said just about half of your kids were proficient. But when those same eighth graders in the same year took the national assessment, 25% of them were proficient. That's half. Now, the national assessment, they were validated in the 1990s, so their bar hasn't changed. And if you look at the chart, this is the chart. This line right here is what makes proficient. You can see it really hasn't changed very much all the way back from the uh, 1990s. And in fact, the national assessment also says that the achievement gap hasn't changed either. So we, the federal government mandated that states create all these standards fundamentally changing education from educating a child to reaching a standard, mandated that you spend a bunch of money, that you create assessments, and the results aren't really very wonderful. What about math? Well, in math, your math, grade four math students at the state assessment level tested at 48% proficient. Those same fourth graders, when they took the national assessment, 35% of them were proficient. Eighth grade math, 43 at the state level, 23% when they took the national assessment. So there's a huge difference in what's happening in these <coughs> pictures. In fact, this is uh, from the National Center in Education Statistics telling you that the NAEP standards for math were set in 1992 and in reading they were set in 1994. So the NAEP hasn't changed its measuring system for more than 20 years, meaning that their numbers are consistent. If this is proficient, it's always proficient. But here in West Virginia, your state board changed the definition of proficient. And so you had a massive drop in the number of students who tested proficient in your state because the state raised the level to be deemed proficient. Hmm. Did the children change? No. Did the teachers change? No. Did the curriculum change? No. The only thing that changed was the definition that your State Board of Education used to assign the label proficient to a child's test paper. It's not based on a raw score. Most people think, well, you know, I got an 80%. Proficient has nothing to do with the percentages. The state comes together and determines this is where we think proficient should be. And in your state, they've moved that line. Well, if it's a moving line, it's meaningless. <coughs> so it means you're attempting to make objective policy decisions on data that has no objectivity inside it. But nobody knows that. Because all parents get is a piece of paper saying, congratulations, little Johnny was proficient. What does proficient mean? They don't tell you that. They just say little Johnny was. West Virginia is not alone. This is from the National Center for Education Statistics. This graph right here is state assessments compared to the national assessment. The brown bar is the achievement level you would need to be considered proficient on the national assessment. This blue bar is what the national assessment calls basic. You remember C minus or D. This means you failed the national assessment. These little red flags are where every state set its definition for proficient on the state assessment. Not one state defined proficient at an achievement level that matched the national assessment. Only eight of them defined proficient at an achievement level that the national assessment would consider a C minus or a D plus. And fully 42 states defined proficient at an achievement level that the national assessment would consider failure. Why did the states do that? Did they not like their children? No. They were mandated by the federal government to achieve an impossible standard. <coughs> Let me move it to healthcare because it will make more sense. We're going to make a law, because we want all of our people in America to be healthy, right? So we're going to make a law that everybody has to have the appropriate blood pressure. And every doctor will be held accountable to make sure that all of his patients achieve that blood pressure level. And if his patients don't achieve that blood pressure level, that doctor can lose his license. 
but the doctor can set that blood pressure level wherever he wants. Where's he going to put it? At 340 over 280, because then everybody will meet it. The federal government forced your state and every state to achieve an impossible standard. Of course what the states did was manipulate the data, because you didn't have a choice. But reality is reality, and eventually it reared its ugly head, which is why by 2010, nearly 60% of our kids who were eligible for college needed remediation when they got there. Because see, the colleges didn't lower the standards. If you were an engineering major, they still did want you to be able to take calculus when you got there. But our kids couldn't do it. So parents were being handed papers saying, congratulations, little Johnny is proficient. And then little Johnny gets to college, and he's not ready for calculus. He's not ready for freshman level English. In fact, this past year, Renaissance Learning, which is one of the um, think tanks in English language arts, reported that the average reading level of incoming college freshmen in America this year was seventh grade. So the colleges had to address their reading lists to only include books that are written at the seventh grade reading level. Where do you find those books? Go into a Barnes and Noble bookstore and walk over to the young adult section. You won't find Dickens or Chaucer or Shakespeare. You'll find the Percy Jackson series and the Hunger Games and Harry Potter. And those things are lots of fun. But not if you're a college freshman. But the colleges have had to adapt. So our kids need remediation. This started to create a ruckus. Now understand, this is after 20 years of federally mandated standards-based education was the result to say, you know, this isn't really working. You can't mandate learning. The Carnegie credit system actually worked. Maybe we should give the control back to the states and let them do what they do best, you know, so that the teachers who've actually met the children have some say over what happens to the children. That's not what happened. Instead, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation stepped into the gap. This is a $2.2 million grant that the Gates Foundation gave to the James B. Hunt Institute. They're a think tank in South Carolina. That year, the Hunt Institute's total income was $2.5 million. So if I'm giving you $2.2 of your $2.5 million, you're going to be very interested in what I have to say. The grant was given to create, move toward the adoption of these rigorous standards. The Hunt Institute, in response, came up with a newsletter. This is the first edition called Blueprint. And they said they were partnering with some other organizations to explore the potential for a common core, and here's as far as we know where the word first surfaced, of international, rigorous internationally benchmarked standards. The Gates Foundation continued to fund the Hunt Institute. The second grant was for five and a half million to work with states to rapidly adopt the standards. You've heard from your senator, the legislatures weren't involved. They weren't involved in any state. This was the federal bureaucracy to the state bureaucracy with Bill Gates' money driving the process. The Hunt Institute then continued to publish its newsletter talking about how a growing number of organizations are expressing support for these standards, and they listed them. So I looked them up. Here's how much money they got from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 25 million, 10 million, 11 million, 37 million, 24 million, 11 million, 4 million, 4 million, and 11 million. That's a lot of money. So it was a marketing circle. The Gates Foundation gave money to the Hunt Institute who said, we need to have these standards and we're hearing from all these organizations who want them. Every one of them got money from the Gates Foundation to say we want them. And then the Hunt Institute with additional money from the Gates Foundation said, oh, well, we need to respond to the call. So it was a marketing circle. And the Gates Foundation funded every step of it. Did Bill Gates know something we don't know? Now, this is from the Washington Post. Mr. Gates was quoted as saying, it would be great if this worked, but we won't know for a decade. Mr. Gates sends his children to a school that does not do Common Core. So it's OK to experiment on your kids, but he protected his. To date, he's spent nearly $300 million through his foundation to prom develop, promote, and now um, defend the Common Core standards. And so the question is, why? This again, it's a, uh, that's a website newspaper. They took their information from the Washington Post, and they talk about how the Gates Foundation has spent all of this money. Why? Well, on the Gates Microsoft website, there's a memo called Tech Essentials for Testing Success 
For many schools, time is running out. Smarter Balance said, we need to have all the schools upgrade their um, windows because XP is running out. So they're going to need the newest version of Windows, which means they'll also need new monitors and new equipment. And the Washington Post said to Mr. Gates, um, so you're going to make billions for Microsoft in taxpayer dollars. Is that why you spent millions in your foundation? And Mr. Gates was shocked, shocked that anyone would even intimate that. Well, what does Smarter Balance say? This is right from the Smarter Balanced um, materials. You need to upgrade Windows. They tell you what to do with Mac and Linus. You need iPads. You need Smarter Balanced certified Android tablets. You need Windows-based tablets running Windows 8 Plus. You need um, Chromebooks running Chrome, the latest Chrome, which hadn't even been released at this point. You need a bigger screen size, you need new headphones, you need a new security system, you need new keyboards, you need a pointing device, and you'll need to upgrade your network. And after they tell you all of that, they say, well, these are just the minimum requirements. Districts should attempt to exceed these requirements in as many machines as possible, or it will take too long to give the tests. Is this altruism or good business? Well, from Mr. Gates' point of view, it's really good business. Now, part of what happened with the funding, we moved back to Gates funding. Organizations said they were going to implement. Achieve is one of the Gates funding, and they said they were doing this at the direction of 48 states, and they were working with two nonprofits, the uh, National Governors Association Center for Best Practices and the Council of Steve, Chief State School Officers. That's right off of Achieve's website. The words at the direction of 48 states, those words are a lie. Not one state legislature appropriated one single penny to achieve for the purpose of writing standards that would be mandatory for the children of that state. Not one state legislature passed one single piece of legislation authorizing Achieve to write standards that would be mandatory for the children of that state. Achieve used private money to develop the standards and then used the threat, the, the carrot of race to the top funds and the threat of an ESEA waiver to tell the states you have to sign a memorandum with achieve a private organization to prove you've adopted the standards. This was not led by the states, it was force fed to them. As the standards were being written, and this is one of their own uh, press releases, people began to say who was writing the standards. So the National Governors Association eventually published the names of the standards development work group. There were 29 of them. According to the press release, they were content experts from Achieve Itself, from ACT, and the College Board. No active K-12 through classroom teachers were on that list, nor were there any freshman-level college professors. If you wanted to know what does it take to be successful as a freshman in college, don't you think you'd ask somebody teaching college freshmen? But they did not. The press release went on to say that the works group's deliberations will be confidential throughout the process. The standards were developed in secret. We don't know who picked the 29 people. We don't know why they were selected. We have no minutes of any meetings. We have no knowledge of what systems they looked at, why they picked the standards that they picked, or why they eventually settled on the system that they, they chose. It was and remains a process that is completely shrouded in secrecy. Nobody knows anything about it. What we do know is that the architect of the standards was a man named David Coleman. He was reported in the Washington Post of joining with Gene Wilhot from the National Governors Association. They're the ones that went to Bill Gates to get the money. Mr. Coleman actually tried to get a job teaching in the New York City public school systems earlier in his career, and they declined to hire him. So a man who could not get a job teaching is driving education in America. The, web, the press release went on to talk about the uh, feedback groups. The work group wrote them. When you debate this, you get all these lists. No, see, there's teachers. There's teachers. The teachers were in the feedback groups. The feedback groups could make suggestions, give comments. But as the press release says, the decisions were made by the work group. The feedback, you know, I have six children. They're all girls except for five of them. It's an IQ joke. How'd you do? <laughs> Every night when they were little, they could ask me for a treat. And every night I could say no. I didn't have to give a reason, and my word was final. The feedback group, they were the children. The work group were the parents in this picture. 
Finally, there was a validation committee that was supposed to compare these to international standards. Originally, there were 30 people on the validation committee. If you pull the document, you'll find 25 signatures. Five members refused to sign. Three of them have not ever made a public statement. Two of them have been very public. One is an ELA expert from Massachusetts and one is a math expert from Stanford University. And they've talked about their experience on the validation committee. But none of their comments or questions or concerns were included in the report. The Common Core um, work group just eliminated the names and the comments of anyone who did not agree to make it look like it was unanimous, even though it wasn't. This is actually the Common Core website. The standards are copyrighted. They are owned by two private organizations. They are copyrighted, and if you use them, you have to say they're copyrighted, unless you're a state. And if a state used them, they didn't have to tell anybody that they were actually privately owned and copyrighted. Now, the website has um, some other more disturbing information. Have you ever bought a car? I'm sure you have, right? You got here in a car. You can go and buy the brand new cars with the 100,000 10 year bumper to bumper manufacturer's warranty. Maybe you can't afford that. So you buy a gently used car that has the balance of the manufacturer's warranty. Maybe you can't afford that. So you go to a dealer and you buy a dealer certified car with the dealer warranty. It's 30 days or 60 days or 90 days with the transmission. Maybe you can't afford that. My youngest son is a junior in college and last summer with great pride and a lot of help from mom, he bought his very first car for $850. So of course you know what the car said in the window. It said, as is. Meaning, as soon as you sign that document, if that car dies one inch after you did it, too bad, it's your problem. The Common Core website says that the Common Core state standards are offered to all of your children as is, the way that our oldest, most dilapidated cars <laughs> are sold. The website goes on to say that the developers of the standards assume no liability whatsoever for any harm that comes to any child, teacher, or school because of the use. And in fact, if you use them, you waive your right to sue them. And it's right on their website. So the writers of these standards don't stand behind them at the same level that Sears stands behind a power tool. <laughs> Did anybody notice? Yes. This is from the Washington Post. While the standards were being written, early childhood professionals began to look at them and notice that there weren't any early childhood experts on the panel. A draft version came out, and early childhood experts looked at it and said, um, we, we don't think these people know anything about early childhood. They're so poorly written. So over 500 early childhood professionals came together to sign a statement complaining about the Common Core state standards. They included teachers and pediatricians and researchers and, and um, child psychologists. The statement said that the signers had grave concerns about the core standards for children, that the standards conflicted with research in cognitive science, in neuroscience, in child development, and in early childhood education about how young children learn, about what they need to learn, and about how to teach them in kindergarten and the early grades. Among the 500 plus signers were the three past presidents of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, which is considered the foremost authority on early childhood education in America today. 11 copies were hand delivered to the writers of the standards. They were ignored. And when the standards finally came out, Dr. Carla Horwitz, who's from Yale, said many of our most experienced early childhood teachers are quitting because these standards will hurt children. Well, was her prediction correct? This is testimony from Mary Calamia. Uh, it was given in New York in October of 2013 in both the House and 2014, I'm sorry, 13, I can't count in both the House and the Senate. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Calamia is a licensed clinical social worker. She does psychotherapy. And she talked about how she was starting to receive phone calls from children all, of all different ages. The children were, many of them honor students, they were mutilating themselves. They were cutting themselves. They were vomiting. As time went on, she started to get calls from elementary schools with kids refusing to go to school. They said they felt stupid. They said the school was too hard. As the test got closer, everything escalated. She said the Common Core state standards are not realistic. You can't regulate biology. The standards keep saying, we're going to have these little ones critical think. 
if you've read the kindergarten standards, the ELA standards, the kids are supposed to take their writing and then, you know, hand it out to their peers and have them all give constructive criticism. There are five in kindergarten. Most kindergartners can't hold board meetings and they don't do constructive criticism. They ask them to be persuasive. In the math standards, instead of teaching them the concrete way to do it, the standards give them a variety of ways. When I was in Massachusetts and now in other states, the, paper, the kids were told, add from the left. So if you have 17 plus 15, 17 plus 15, 75 is 12, put down the two, carry the one, one, two, three, 32. That's the algorithm. It's the simplest and most direct way to do it. And in traditional education, we taught our children, this is how you do it. We taught them the simplest, most direct way, most likely to result in success, gave them adequate practice. They could do it. I'm smart. But the common core standards never teach them a single way. They never teach them the standard algorithm. They throw at them a multitude of ways to do it or tell the kids, figure it out by yourself and then debate it. So add from the left. Now I'll tell you, I've taught math all the way up to and including calculus. I actually do add from the left. And if you talk to engineers, they probably do too because you look at it, you pull out all the tens and then you just look what's left. But I'm not seven. And I'm not just learning how. What you hear is these are harder. They're more rigorous. No, they're not. They're just more complicated in an unnecessary and harmful way. So the little ones can't do it. Because they can't think abstractly because their brains haven't physically developed to the point where they can think abstractly. Their prefrontal cortex isn't done yet. But the other thing little ones can't do is evaluate the grown-ups. So when a grown-up hands a little person a paper or a test or a homework assignment and says, I would like you to do this, you should sit in the front. I'm going to use you as an example on it. Um, and the little one can't do it. The only place the little one can go is to say, I'm stupid. Because they can't evaluate the grown-up. You can ask me anything at the end, well, except for my weight. Just hang on. They can't evaluate the grown-up. So they internalize inability to do it with I'm stupid. If a child thinks they're stupid before they're 10, they think that for the rest of their lives. That's why early childhood educators are quitting. That's why teachers are complaining. The standards are developmentally inappropriate. And that's, in fact, what this licensed clinical social worker said, that we're asking them to make um, critical thinking, decision making, and abstract thinking prematurely. They cannot do it. And then when they fail, they can't handle the dissonance. So the only place they have to go is to say it's me. The failure is me. Additionally, we ask them to write all of these persuasive things when they're really little, but little ones don't know how to persuade because little ones can't see a point of view other than their own. You know when you're seven, if you're having corn, everybody's having corn? They can't see another world view. So the only way they know how to persuade is to be um, angry or to try to make you afraid. So we're, we're tapping into, it's called the limbic system, we're tapping into an emotional place that we actually don't want children to go to, but Common Core forces them there, which is why you have all of the emotional problems that the social workers are now seeing. I was in New York and talking about this and a mother in the back of the room went, my eight-year-old just pulled out all of her eyelashes. That's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking to hear that from children. You are a smarter balanced state. And in the smarter balanced, your assessment system uses what are called online adaptive tests. That means that the tests change while the child is taking the test. So you can be sitting beside him in the same classroom at the same time, but you won't be taking the same test because the tests adapt depending on your answers. I can, the, the computer is, is, can be programmed to make the questions easier or harder. So if you are frustrated, I can make the questions easier. If you're doing well, I can make them harder. I can test for frustration levels. I can manipulate it to test what, at what point will this child become frustrated. And no one will ever know because it's, a, it's all inside the computer. It's an online adaptive test. And this is right out of the Smarter Balanced. Um, this is your state agreement with Smarter Balance. So it's right in your contract. 
This is how Smarter Bounce, this is right off of their website. The test item difficulty is based on student responses. Not all students receive the same questions. So the test manipulates while the child is taking the test. Then how do you know if what your child's proficient meant is the same as what his neighbor's proficient meant? Because you have no way of knowing if they're taking the same test, even though they're in the same classroom at the same time. This is the agreement that Smarter Balance signed with the United States Department of Education. They're developing assessment systems. They're for all student subgroups. They're going to fill, they're going to be required to do all of the things that this agreement lays out. So what did you agree to do when you adapted Smarter Balance? Well, you would develop an assessment system that measures student knowledge. You would uh, elicit complex demonstrations. You would measure achievement across an academic year. And as we go down, the systems will produce data including student achievement and student growth data. So it's, it's producing student level data. And you agreed to produce that data inside uh, your, the agreement that Smarter Balance signed with the federal government. Addition, continuing walk through the agreement, it's the department, and here we are, this agreement is to work with the department to make student level data that results from the assessment available on an ongoing basis for research. So not only does the data go, student level data go to research or to the government, it can be given to researchers. Now you heard about data being hacked. I was in Massachusetts last week. And a school district inadvertently put student data online. And what they discovered was not just that the data was identifiable, and a local paper actually wrote about how they could identify seven of the children from the data that was, was made available, but the district was rating the parents on how cooperative they were with the district. So instead of the parents rating the schools, the schools were rating the parents. And it was part of the portfolio of the child. In the budget, again, in your... Um, this is for Smarter Balance. The federal government, this is how much money it was going to cost. $159 million and then an additional $15 million was given. The grantee must provide timely and complete access to any and all data collected at the state level. ED is the education department of the federal government. Or its designated program monitors, technical assistance providers, or research partners. So your state, by signing into Smarter Balance, lost the right to protect the data of the children in your state because you had to provide it to Smarter Balanced and they in return for the $159 million had to provide it to the federal government and anyone that the federal government told them to. Um, not only did they have to provide it, they had to make it available on an ongoing basis, student level, ongoing basis. So we've started this research project and we want to come back we have to be able to tap back into the data. So it's not just a one-shot deal. This is an ongoing process that was agreed to. This is from Smarter Balanced itself as we're talking about the, the test and how the test is worded. Because remember, this is supposed to be higher level and valid and reliable. According to the Smarter Balanced information, starting in grade six, and that's, I know it's hard to read, in the middle of grade six, they can start to use a calculator on the assessment. So we're not testing math, we're testing their ability to push the buttons on a calculator. The assessment includes what are called universal tools that include a calculator, a spell checker, and a glossary. There's a glossary available that if you don't know what one of the words